getting Perla to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> so Perla Susie is going to talk about intersecting random walks. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, and uh, uh, so today I'm going to talk about so I'm going to talk about self-interacting random walks. And this is joint work with uh, Yuval Perez, Sergei Popov, and another paper with Yuval and Bruno Shapira. So let me start by uh, stating the problem. So suppose that we have two measures, mu1 and mu2. There are two probability measures. in R3, and I'm going to suppose that they have zero mean. And I'm also going to assume that they are fully supported. By what I mean that uh, the support of each measure contains three linearly independent vectors. So for both I, And now I'm going to generate a random walk in R3 in the following way. Uh, so it's going to start from zero. And on the first visit to a vertex, it's going to generate a step according to the first measure mu1. And on later visits to the same vertex, it's going to generate a, a, a step according to the measure mu2. So let me write it. So x0 is 0. And say on the first visit to a vertex, generate the next step according to mu1. And on later visits to the same vertex, generate a step according to mu2. Uh, so what is a vertex? Um, I'm sorry, I just mean the first visit to a point in R3. Okay. Um, OK, so there could be any measure. And I'm actually going to be interested in a more general rule, which is just going to be adapted. So all I care is just to look at the history of the process up to time t, and then generate the next step according to this history. So for now, you can think that these are discrete measures to make sense of the question. But in a second, I'm going to be talking about uh, general adapted rules. So I'll define that uh, in a minute. Uh, so this was a question, uh, so the question is, uh, is the resulting walk X transient or recurrent? Or if we are in R3, whether it is neighborhood recurrent? So linearly independent, you mean linearly independent over Z? Or over uh, in R3. Over R. In over R. R. Over R, yes. Okay. Uh, so the question whether the resulting walk So this was a question which was asked by uh, Itai Benyamini in a paper with him, Gadi Cosma, and Bruno Sapira. And, and so now let me define the process uh, more formally. And then I'll talk about uh, this question. So more generally, I'm going to start a walk from zero 
x0 from 0, and I'm going to generate two IID sequences. So the first sequence is xi11, xi21, etc. They are IID according to the measure mu1. And the second sequence, xi12, xi22, and so on, they are IID according to mu2. Uh, and now the walk, when it is at xt, then the next step is going to be t plus 1 of L of t, so I have to say what L of t is. Uh, so L of t can take only two values, either z uh, 1 or 2. And it is adapted in the sense that uh, it is measurable with respect to all the variables x0 up to xt. So this is clearly a non-Markovian walk because we have to keep track of the whole history of the process to determine the next jump every time. And uh, the question of Ita is whether this walk is transient or recurrent. Um, and this is the first theorem that uh, we proved with Yuval and Sergei Popov. And so what we actually showed is that if we have any two such measures that are zero mean and fully supported, then for any adapted rule, for any rule L of t, then the resulting work is always transient. So for for any two such measures, and when I say such measures, I mean zero mean and fully supported, and any adapted rule L, the walk X is transient, which means that the norm of X t goes to infinity as t goes to infinity almost surely. So we have some assumption on, so we want two plus little bit, two plus vita moments. Uh, so today I'm going to present uh, most of the ideas of the proof of this theorem. Uh, but before I start that, I would like to say a few words about what happens when we combine more, more than two measures. So intuitively one would think that when we combine transient measures, then it's impossible to get a recurrent walk in R3. Um, but uh, this is actually not the case, and uh, this is something that has been considered before. And I'm going to give some more examples um, towards the end of my talk. Um, there are some examples in the notes of Offer Zaytuni, for instance. Uh, but um, in our work, um, we, we have the most economical number of measures in all dimensions in the sense that uh, in all dimensions d, if we have, uh, we show that one can find uh, d uh, fully supported measures, so that where, when they are combined according to a specific rule, then the resulting work is, uh, we can make the resulting work recurrent. So again, so for any d, There exists d um, zero mean fully supported measures. And an adapted rule so that the resulting work so that the resulting work is recurrent. 
Um, so one quick comment. Uh, I stated this theorem for two fully supported measures in R3. Uh, I mean in RD. I'm sorry. So um, I would like to make a quick comment that, uh, of course, if one has uh, two fully supported measures in RD for any d greater than 3, then again, the resulting work, if we use any adapted rule, the resulting work is going to be transient uh, simply by projection. Um, so for, um, for this theorem, I would like... Yeah, so I'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let me say that first, and then I will explain what is the work that is used here. Um, so, so we think, uh, so this is sharp, and uh, this is actually uh, an ongoing work of uh, Yuval Nazarov and Ronen Eldan. I think it's uh, written, but uh, it's not available yet. <coughs> uh, so, uh, let me talk about, um, let me explain the example. Uh, what are the, um, the, recurrent me the transient measures that give us a recurrent walk in this case? And I will only talk about R3. <coughs> so the walk is very easy to describe. Suppose that you are at the point X. So it's actually um, a lattice walk. So if we are at the point X1, X2, X3, then I'm going to choose the coordinate with the biggest absolute value. So suppose that x1 is bigger than x2 and x3 in absolute value, then I'm going to pick the largest coordinate with big probability and change it by plus minus 1 equal likely. And uh, the other two coordinates will be picked with the remaining small probability. So with probability 1 minus epsilon, pick, in this case, the first coordinate and change by plus minus 1 equal likely. And with the remaining one, epsilon over 2 and epsilon over 2, choose each of the other two coordinates. So the idea is that when epsilon is very small, then with very big probability, we always pick, uh, with very big probability, we pick the coordinate with the maximal absolute value. And so intuitively, this is saying that the walk is basically walking along the radial direction. And so this is why uh, it is recurrent. But actually, proving so that. That's right. But yeah, but here we are combining three measures because the first measure is pick the first coordinate with probability 1 minus epsilon, the rest with epsilon over 2, epsilon over 2. The second one. Uh, the second coordinate the and so on. I mean, it's it could be it could depend also. That's right, but uh, we are combining uh, three transient walks because um, one thing. So here, um, each of these measures, if it's used on its own, then it generates a transient walk. But the question is, when we combine them in some way, whether the resulting walk is transient or recurrent. But this is a Markov chain. Um, it's combining three measures, and it is recurrent. The intuition is what I said, that it mainly walks along the radial direction. Uh, but turning this intuition into a rigorous argument um, was uh, quite technical. Uh, so I'm not going to present the proof of that, but later I will give an example of a walk which uses more than three measures, um, more than three transient measures, and uh, the resulting walk is actually recurrent. <coughs> Sorry, I'm not sure. The measures can depend, the choice of measures can depend on the whole history. The yeah, so here history, you just. The whole history of the steps in particular allows to depend on the It's got yeah. so even the L of T. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 On this board. L of T is measurable. It's adapted. <laughs> uh, 
Okay, so um, okay, so now I'm going to present the proof of the first theorem. So there are many techniques, um, if we have a Markov chain, then there are many techniques to show that it's transient or recurrent, either using electrical networks or using, um, um, or using Fourier series. Uh, but uh, these techniques don't transfer to the setting because uh, the work is non-Markovian. But um, what we were actually able to prove, wa to, to use, is the technique of Lyapunov functions, um, and we were able to transfer that uh, to this case. So what I mean by that is, so we want to find the Lyapunov function. By what I mean, we want a function phi, which is positive, and phi of x goes, uh, goes to zero, even only if the norm of x goes to infinity, such that phi of x t is a super martingale. Um, so I claim that if we can do that, then this implies that the work is transient. Um, and let me quickly uh, recall why this implies transience. So if I define TR, the first exit time of the ball of radius R, then it's not hard to check that TR is finite almost surely. Uh, and so what this is saying is that the limb soup of xt is equal to, inf uh, is equal to infinity almost surely. Uh, and so this implies that limb inf of phi of xt is zero. But so far, I haven't used that uh, phi of xt is a super martingale. Uh, so I'm going to use it now. So we know that phi is positive, and phi of xt is a super martingale. So by the, martingale, the super martingale convergence theorem, it follows that uh, phi of xt has a limit. So this limit is actually a limit. And so this implies that x t goes to infinity. So, um, so what we want to do is to find uh, a function phi, as I wrote here, so that phi of xt is a super martingale. Uh, and um, first we thought of uh, the way that one proves that Brownian motion is transient in dimension 3. Uh, so one uses the function 1 over the norm of, of Brown. so phi of x is 1 over the norm of x. Um, and this is a uh, martingale in the right region. Uh, but in this case here, we are going to change it a tiny bit. And so I'm going to take phi of x to be 1 over the norm of x. And I'll take it to some power alpha that will be determined. And let's say minimum 1. Uh, so the goal is to show that uh, phi of x t is a super martingale. Uh, actually, this is not going to be right for all uh, for all measures mu1 and mu2, but uh, I'll show in the proof how one can change it in order to have uh, the super martingale property for all measures. Okay, uh, so let So alpha will be determined, yes, and it will depend on the measures. So for now, uh, let me just focus on only one measure, and then we'll see how uh, the second measure will come. 
So as I said, we want to show that the uh, phi of xt is a super martingale. Uh, so what it means is that we want to show that the expectation of phi of x plus z minus phi of x is less than or equal to 0. And let's say that z is chosen according to mu 1. I'm just focusing on the case of one measure. So if we show that for all x, or at least for all x large enough, then we are done. Okay, so now let me take that and write the Taylor series. around the point Z, which is Z1, Z2, Z3. So I do want to write the whole Taylor series on the board, uh, but uh, let me uh, just explain that the first term uh, will disappear because after we take the expectation, because we have assumed that the measure has zero mean. Uh, the third term is going to be, I'm going to do Taylor series up to second order terms. So the third term, uh, we can control it and it's going to be small. Uh, so I'm only going to focus on the second term and on the second order term. And what we want to show is that uh, this term is strictly negative. So we need to show that this is strictly negative. And once we have that, then we can control the third, the, the error term, and we are done. So uh, z is the vector z1, z2, z3, which is distributed according to the measure mu1. And I have assumed that mu1 is zero mean and fully supported. Uh, so this means that if I look at the covariance matrix of mu1, then this is a strictly positive definite matrix. So let me denote by m1 the covariance matrix of mu1 is strictly positive definite matrix. And let me write lambda1, lambda2, lambda3 for the eigenvalues. Then, if we take the cross product, when i is not equal to j, this is, so if I write now z in the basis of eigenvectors, then the cross product will be zero, and the expectation of z i squared is going to be equal to lambda i. So um, taking phi of x to be 1 over x to the alpha and doing the calculations, uh, we get that this expression here, right star, is equal Yes, that's right. And uh, so far, I'm only using, um, I'm assuming that z is distributed according to mu1. Uh, so for this case, we get the sum of alpha xi squared. And then in the brackets, I have lambda i times alpha plus 2 minus the trace of the covariance matrix of the measure mu1. So if the trace of the covariance matrix of, um, of, mu, of mu1 is bigger than twice the maximal eigenvalue of the matrix, then this quantity here is always going to be negative. Alpha For alpha small enough, sorry. So if 
the trace of M1 is strictly bigger than twice the maximal eigenvalue, then for alpha small, this expression is going to be negative. Uh, and here I'm only looking at one measure. And as I said before, we know that if we generate a walk using this only this measure, then the resulting walk is going to be transient. However, this condition might not always be satisfied. So if it is not satisfied, then how would we show that using this approach that uh, the resulting walk using just this measure is transient? Well, um, the matrix, as I said, so we have written it already in diagonal form. And I can multiply it from the left and from the right by a suitable matrix to reduce it to the identity. So if I multiply by 1 over root lambda 1, 1 over root lambda 2, 1 over root lambda 3 from both sides, then this is going to give me the identity matrix. And the identity clearly satisfies uh, this condition that I have here. Um, and what does it mean to multiply this covariance matrix from the left and from the right by this matrix, this diagonal matrix, it simply means that we are multiplying uh, the step of the, the walk by this matrix. And, and since this condition now is satisfied, this means that uh, the walk, this ma let me call this matrix A, it means that the walk AXT is transient, which is saying that AXT goes to infinity, as t goes to infinity, and so in particular it implies that xt goes to infinity. So if we have just one measure, then that's a way to show that the resulting work is transient. We, might, we reduce the covariance matrix to the identity. This satisfies our condition. And then the function that we are using phi, we are actually applying it to the work ax. And this shows that x is transient. Um, so now let's see what happens. I guess I'm just read here. So now let's see what happens when we have two measures. So um, when we have two measures, remember this was uh, this expectation uh, when z is sampled according to mu1. So in order for the resulting work to be transient, if we knew that both measures satisfied this condition, then we would be done. So this immediately now gives us an algebraic criterion uh, for the resulting work to be transient. So criterion for transients. So suppose that we have mu1, mu2, mu k, they are mean 0. fully supported measures. If we can find a matrix A, which is common for all of them, a matrix such that, so let me write M capital I for the covariance of the measure mu I. So if we can find a matrix A, uh, so this is true in all dimensions. So if we can find the matrix A so that uh, the trace for all i, so if we can find a common matrix that balances them all, um, then the resulting work is transient. for any adapted rule. Okay. Uh, so now I'm going to explain um, why in three dimensions uh, with two measures we can always find such a matrix A.
So as I already showed, um, I guess it was here. Uh, so I already showed <coughs> that um, if we have, so let me write, b equal to 3 and k equal to 2. So for one matrix, uh, we can reduce it to the identity. So m1 can be reduced to the identity. Uh, and the transformation we have applied to M1, in order for it to become the identity, we have to apply it also to the other matrix M2. But both of them were assumed to be strictly positive definite, so even after applying the transformation, uh, the new matrix is still going to be strictly positive definite. So we have a new matrix, I'll just write it M2 tilde, which is strictly positive definite. So I can multiply it by an orthogonal matrix, like that, and bring it uh, to the in diagonal form. And I'm writing the eigenvalues in decreasing order. So of course I have to apply the same matrix to M1, but since V is orthogonal, it's not going to change the identity. Okay, so one of the two matrices is the identity, which is good, and the other one is in diagonal form. So if the second one already satisfies the condition that we want for the trace to be twice the at least twice the maximal eigenvalue, then we are done. Uh, but um, if this matrix does not satisfy the condition, so if the trace is smaller than twice the maximal, then I'm going to multiply this matrix from the left and from the right by the following matrix. So it would be over root A. And doing that will bring this matrix to be diagonal, B, B, C, and all zeros. And uh, since they were already in, um, no, so the maximal eigenvalue here is B. And so <coughs> this satisfies the condition. But now we also have to multiply the identity by this matrix. And so, so the identity is going to become B over A, 1, 1. But B was assumed to be smaller than A, so this matrix also satisfies the trace condition. And so we are done. So for three measures, eh, for two measures in three dimensions, um, we have showed that uh, we can always find a common matrix A so that um, the trace of the new matrix is at least twice the maximal eigenvalue. And uh, so by what I explained earlier, this implies that the walk is transient. So um, now I would like to say a few words about combining more measures. Um, in, um, so first I'll talk about uh, three dimensions. Uh, so the work I described here uh, is recurrent, but as I promised, I'll give a simpler example of, uh, I mean, uh, this is a very simple example, but uh, it's uh, quite technical to prove. I'll give an example uh, which is uh, very easy to prove. So. So we are in R3, and from whenever we are at the point X, I'm going to move in the radial direction um, according to a Gaussian N01 in this direction. And on the hyperplane perpendicular to this direction, to the radial direction, I'm going to choose a direction at random, and along this direction, I'm going to move according to a normal, to a normal zero one again. Uh, then, by Pythagoras theorem, if we look at the distance from the origin of the point where we jump to, this is going to be the same as the distance from the origin for a two-dimensional Gaussian walk, and uh, we know that this is neighborhood recurrent. So, this is an example of a walk in um, in three dimensions, which is uh, recurrent, but um, it is actually combining an infinite number of measures. So now I will uh, show how we can get a walk which uh, combines only a finite number of measures and is still recurrent. So 
So I take the sphere in R3, and I'm going to cover it with cups, completely cover it with cups, with the property that the angle between the center and any point is at most pi over 4. And now the work is going to involve in the following way. For any point, I join it to the origin, and I see which cup it intersects, which cup this line intersects. And then in the direction, OK, let me just do it again here. OK, so it intersects this point x, it intersects this cup, and then in this direction, where I join the center of the cup to 0, um, I'm just going to move uh, plus minus 1 equal likely. And on the plane perpendicular to this direction, we choose in advance uh, two vectors, um, two orthogonal vectors. And in each of these two directions, uh, with uh, some small pro so with big probability, we move along this direction. And with small probability, we choose each of the other two directions. So this is kind of a discretization of uh, the Gaussian walk. And uh, it's only using exactly the, num the number of measures it's using is exactly the number of cups that we need to cover the sphere. And again, if with large probability um, we choose the radial direction, then the resulting walk um, is basically moving along the radial direction. And so it is recurrent. And um, this is not hard to prove. Uh, rigorously just using the log function. OK, so now in the last part of the talk, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, our joint work with uh, Yuval and Bruno Sapira. Uh, so in the original paper of uh, Itai, Benjamini, Cosma, and, um, and Bruno, um, they asked the question that uh, I discussed already. But um, what they proved was that if you combine, so you are in Z4, and on the first visit to a vertex, you move the first two coordinates according to a 2D step. And in later vi on later visits to the same vertex, you move the last two coordinates according to a 2D step. And uh, what they showed is that uh, this walk is um, this work is transient in four dimensions. So um, in this case, they are combining uh, two two-dimensional works. So it doesn't fall in the category of R theorem. And, and they asked whether the following work is transient or recurrent. So suppose you are now in Z2. And on the first visit to a vertex, you move horizontally plus minus 1 equal likely. And on later visits to the same vertex, you move uh, vertically, plus minus one equal likely. So first visit, um, say horizontally, plus minus one, and later visits vertically. And the question is, Uh, if the resulting work is transient or recurrent. Uh, and as far as I know, this is still an open problem. Uh, but um, let's now consider the equivalent question uh, in three dimensions. So as I said in the paper, they considered uh, four dimensions, and we used two uh, two-dimensional measures. And they ask what happens in three dimensions if um, you combine a two-dimensional and a one-dimensional uh, measure. So 
So now we are on Z3. And on the first visit <coughs> to vertex. So let me call the walk <coughs> XYZ. Change Z by plus minus one. Equal likely. And on later visits, let x comma y perform a 2D step. All equal likely. And again, the same question, uh, whether the walk is transient, the resulting walk is transient or recurrent. And so what we showed is that uh, the resulting walk is actually transient. And I would like to give a very quick overview of the proof and also mention um, a result which is of independent interest um, about uh, defocusing of martingales. Um, so the idea of the proof The idea is to condition <coughs> on all of the two-dimensional process, all of the jumps that the two-dimensional process makes, and observe uh, the third coordinate, z, <coughs> only at the times when the two-dimensional process moves. And then in this way, we obtain a martingale. So let me write it more formally. So condition. on all of the jumps of x comma y and define now a sequence of times tau k as follows. So tau 0 is 0 and tau k plus 1 is the first time after tau k that x comma y moved. Then if we set mt to be z evaluated at this time tau t, <coughs> then this is a martingale. In order to show that uh, the walk is transient, uh, it suffices to show that the number of visits to zero is finite almost surely. So what we need to show is so the sum of the probabilities at a time n, uh, the walk is at zero. The 2D walk is at zero with probability 1 over n at time n. And then we have to multiply that by the probability that the martingale is at zero. And we want to show that uh, this is finite. If we have that, then uh, we are done. <coughs> so as I said, um, now I'm going to state a result about martingale satisfying certain assumptions um, that um, show that uh, the martingale is uh, defocused. Uh, and the statement that uh, I will write down is not exactly, the assumptions that I'll write down are not exactly satisfied by the martingale M. But um, the actual proposition that we have in the paper is quite technical, so I didn't want to get into that uh, here. But I'll just state the lemma, which is the corollary of our result, which is of independent interest. So suppose that 
Amy is a martingale. Starting from zero. And I'm assuming that the conditional variance given fk is at least one for all k less than n. And also, uh, the increments of the martingale are upper bounded by log n to the a, where a is strictly smaller than one, some number smaller than one. Then, then we're able to show that the probability that mn is at zero, at m is at zero time n, is upper bounded by exponential of minus log to the one minus a. <coughs> Uh, but uh, as I said, the martingale that I wrote here does not uh, directly satisfy these assumptions. Um, so um, I would like to say that the similar results uh, were proven before by Ken Alexander and by um, Ori Gurel Gurevich Yuval and Ofer Zaytouni. Uh, the difference is that in their result, they um, also had an upper bound on the variance, uh, which uh, we had to remove uh, for our application. And I'll stop here. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, is it possible to uh, uh, unite the first result and the last one so that uh, assuming that uh, uh, if you have uh, union of supports of two measures uh, contain uh, three in linearly independent vectors, then it's uh, uh, transient. You mean for this particular case? No, uh, maybe more general result than the first one. Then there you wanted uh, each measure, uh, support of each measure contain three. Right. If union, if you assume union, then uh, this, uh, this also comes into. But I don't think it's true. Uh, it's not true. You can have one one dimension, and the other one, yeah. you never touch the other one. One. Dimensional and, and the you second touch, one. Well, you never touch the other one. Or you very rarely touch the other one. Mm. Right. But here they do not touch also. Here you do touch. No. Okay. It doesn't seem possible. Mm -hmm. In the first result, she had a completely general adaptive group. And that depends on all the measures being fully supported. That okay. is fair. In the second result, the rule was very special, special, and exactly the number of times you visit, you know, you do each step matters. So we don't. There doesn't seem to be any way to combine. So Anybody else? Is it possible for dimension two uh -huh. to make something? To make something transient? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, so actually, it's a very simple walk. Um, when you are below the diagonals, uh, I mean, yeah. in between, then you move uh, with, so you move the smallest coordinate with probability 0 0.4 and the other one with 0 0.6, and you do. So in here, so you move horizontally with probability 0 0.4 and vertically with probability 0 0.6. And you do 
the converse outside, then for that, if you take the measure mu equal to one everywhere, then it's an excessive measure. And so it is, um, it doesn't satisfy, it's invariant everywhere except for zero. So it doesn't, uh, so it is uh, transient. So there's no uh, general uh, stuff, general definition of the case, no? You mean uh, results yeah. for two yeah. dimensions? No, and so Yuval also has another paper uh, where um, you, for every n, you move for two to the n steps up or down, and then two to the n steps left or right, and then you increase n and you do the same thing. So this is also transient. Uh, but um, the question that I know about Z2 is uh, the one I mentioned. On the first visit, you move in one way, and later visit the other way, and this is not known at all. Anybody else? Thanks, the speaker.